These days, there's no shortage of people proclaiming that religion, scary, has no place in the modern, civilized world. And particularly on the internet, it's uh, a bit of sport to come up with a, a clever graphic that shows in one quick look of the obvious foolishness of anyone who would uh, be part of a community of faith today. Lots of different examples of this abound, but uh, one that I've seen is a kind of Excel page. And it's trying to show uh, prayer versus work when trying to solve a problem. And so it's kind of three columns. The first column is a list of statements. The second column has prayer at the top. The third column has work at the top. And prayer is better for a certain thing. Prayer seems more appealing. Prayer gets the check. And if work seems more appealing, work gets the check. So you're supposed to tally them up. And so the statements say things like this. Uh, can be conveniently done anywhere, by anyone, at any time. Prayer gets the check, right? Or minimal training required. Prayer gets the check. And on and on it goes. Many statements like this. Prayers getting all of the checks. Till the very last statement at the bottom, which says, actually solves the problem. Work, check, prayer, nothing. So, the obvious message here is that prayer just makes you feel like you're doing something, but it's actually pointless. Now, those who hold views like this often consider themselves to be enlightened, modern, progressive types. Uh, completely unaware that the kinds of criticisms that they're leveling aren't modern at all. They're ancient. They've been around from time immemorial. We see a similar kind of case being made in his own way by Judas Iscariot in today's gospel. So in the scene, we have Mary of Bethany. Um, the text reminds us that this is uh, Lazarus' sister, and she had just witnessed quite recently Jesus bringing her brother back from the dead. She'd seen with her own eyes uh, the power of Christ. She believes with her whole heart and soul that Jesus is the Messiah, her Lord and Savior. And coming from this place of devotion, she performs this over-the-top gesture, taking this costly perfume and anointing Jesus' feet, wiping his feet with her hair. It even goes so far to say the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, sure, but of her devotion as well. And such an intimate act that some of us Americans might recoil a little bit, you know, not just in COVID, but in any time. We like a little social distance, you know. She's getting right up there to him, right? But Jesus, Jesus, he accepts her. He's not only the great giver, through whom all things came to be, the king of creation, everything belongs to him. He's also a generous receiver. He knows Mary's heart. He knows her desire to show her love for him as her Lord, as her God. Jesus sees her action as right, good, joyful thing. In St. Matthew's telling of this same event, Jesus says she has done a beautiful thing. He's not put off by any social awkwardness or how it might look to an outsider who doesn't know Mary, who doesn't know Lazarus' story. Jesus honors Mary by accepting her pure devotion. But Judas, Judas isn't convinced. He sees nothing but waste here. That ointment could have been sold for 300 denarii and the proceeds given to the poor. Well, how much is that? Well, it's about $100 in today's money. So not an earth-shattering amount, but a good chunk of change. And the evangelist, St. John, who's writing the story, of course, he knows how it turns out. He knows what kind of man Judas is. So he can give us these uh, a sort of author's perspective lines and well, we know who he is. You know, he just wanted to steal the money and, and this and that to make Judas look extra bad. Uh, but in St. Matthew's version, it's actually all of the disciples 
who uh, denounce Jesus here and have this question about waste. So maybe St. John is cleaning it up a little bit and putting it all on Judas. But regardless of whether it was the whole group or whether it was just Judas, you know, it seems like there is a case to be made here. You know, did Jesus really need to have this ointment poured on his feet when there were really people who were hungry outside? Seems a reasonable thing. Jesus pushes back. And what he's really pushing back on is this idea that the only thing that matters is material condition. Of course, material conditions matter. Our Lord knows that. He fed people physically. He healed people physically. The church, in our time, we work to try to eliminate poverty in our country and around the world to make sure that all of God's children have a stake in the material world that ultimately comes from God, recognizing that none of us are self-made make any sense from a Christian perspective. But Christ is showing us that that cannot be our sole focus, the material. In the desert, at the beginning of Lent, Jesus told Satan, one does not live by bread alone. This is another way to give the same message. Mary anoints Jesus' feet with something extravagant not all about material. In his summary of the law, Jesus says to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Both are necessary. And you see, Judas, he didn't really love God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because he couldn't see the beauty of Mary's devotion to her Lord, nor could he understand Jesus' acceptance of her devotion. Judas, it was just waste. But Jesus saw Mary's devotion for what it was, a sign of her love of God, of Christ who is God, her love of he who is the true bread which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, gives life to her in her very act of devotion. In our time, we have this kind of secularism that would cause a person to make that prayer versus work charge. That person sees the devotion of the church in the same way that Judas saw the devotion of Mary of Bethany, a waste which could have been put to better use. How sad. But this kind of Judas-like judgment, whether from Judas himself or whether from the voices of our own time, this judgment against using time, energy, or financial resources in the service and pure love of our Lord makes two flawed assumptions. First, that only the material world exists, and it's all that matters. That's first. And second, that the worship of God does nothing to help material conditions in any meaningful way whatsoever. Quickly, these two objections. The second first, that worship has no impact, no impact on the world. This is quite obviously false. The liturgies of the church, prayer, fellowship in Christ have provided untold millions of people through the centuries with hope, with community, we know that today, isolation and loneliness is all over the place. People are less connected than ever as church attendance has decreased. The church and its ministers, ordained and lay alike, who walk with communities, who walk with individuals through the darkest depths of their lives and are present with them at the heights of their joy. And the church, through its teaching, led countless people to self-sacrificial love of neighbor, of every neighbor, Christian and non-Christian alike. If not following the religious teachings of Jesus, there's nothing really to stop someone from simply being a hedonist. Why not just spend it on yourself? 
Mary could have used the anointment on herself. Who's to say if she didn't use it on Jesus, she would have sold it and given it to the poor? Why not just use it for herself? She bought it. She offers it up in sacrifice, having followed her Lord into that self-sacrificial spirit. Communal worship opens our heart to the service of the world. It cannot be ignored. But more to the point, more fundamentally, the first assumption that only material conditions matter, only the material world matters, here is the fatal flaw. You see, adoration of Christ at the altar, adoration of our Savior at its most fundamental level can never be explained or argued for in terms of some other benefit in terms of how it helps us serve our neighbor, even though it does. That can't be where we go at the first. To think of how silly that is, it's like talking about the virtue of a marriage, that you have this couple, they're engaged to be married, and you only could talk about it in terms of, well, she's got a lot of great business connections that's going to grow his business, and he's got an inheritance coming, so we know she's going to be taken care of. And won't it be good that he has children to carry on his legacy and to never even mention the love that they have for each other, the pure joy they have for one another for its own sake, not for some further benefit, but that is the thing itself. That is what Mary of Bethany chose for Jesus in today's gospel. First and foremost, her love for her Lord and Savior in itself not for anything else, but in itself, is a primary, first-order good. And so, too, all of us who take the title Christian, when we turn our hearts to the Lord in love, we do this because it's something that is beyond good. It is our very reason to be. I've spoken to you in the name of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.